Well, ladies and gentlemen, academic colleagues, good afternoon. My name is Maxine McHugh, and it's my very great pleasure to be your host, your MC for today's launch of the Melbourne Disability Institute. Now, I think it's fair to say of all the many new initiatives and fine centres that the University of Melbourne supports, I know there are many in the room this afternoon who feel a particular pride in what we are here to celebrate today. I'm going to keep my comments brief um, because we're going to hear shortly from some very important guests who've made today's announcement possible. I think it's fair to say that um, timing is not everything in life, but it's pretty close. Well over a decade ago, Bruce Bonnie Hattie was a highly organised advocate with a big transformative idea to advance social change in Australia with the introduction of a national insurance scheme for those with a disability. The very broad coalition that Bruce and many others corralled was ready to seize the day in the late 2000s when a political opportunity opened up in our federal parliament. The passage of the NDIS was a big victory. But as we know, we're only at the beginning. Now, when I met Bruce in his new role here at the university, I guess just over a year ago, I remember him saying, we have to put a whole ecosystem around the NDIS. And so just at the time, timing again, just at the time when the still very new National Dis Disability Agency is hitting some, let's, let's say, operational problems, how important is it that we'll have a dedicated research institute that can work in partnership with all stakeholders and gather and analyze longitudinal data and importantly to continue to work on innovative public policy. We'll be hearing soon from Bruce, uh, from Professor Anne Kavanagh, from Paralympian Carney Liddell, and from our Vice-Chancellor, Glyn Davis. And it's now um, uh, my pleasure to ask the Vice-Chancellor at the University of Melbourne, Glyn Davis, fresh off a plane from uh, Berlin this morning, to come up here and officially launch the Institute. That's okay. That's great. No? Fantastic. Thank you. I thought I was the last of a whole run of speeches, so... Uh, it's great. Um, can I join everyone in welcoming you here? Can I thank Auntie Di, as always, for her generous welcome? Can I apologise for the head cold you can clearly hear that's going to make this tricky? Um, I'd like to acknowledge lots of people because there's such a great collection of people here. Uh, Secretary Gamlin of the Department of Empowerment of Persons with Disabilities from the Government of India, who's here, uh, with responsibility for 80 million people in her portfolio. That's, that's just one huge portfolio, and it's a delight that you're here. Can I also welcome very warmly Dr. Helen Nugent, the chair of the Disability National Disability Insurance Agency. I've known and admired Helen's work in the public and private spheres for a very long time, and we all wish her such strength in this job because it is so important to the nation. Helen, welcome. I welcome, of course, the many people with disability and family members and carers and those who advocate for people with disability who are here tonight. Uh, I welcome the members of the Melbourne academic community, the university, the hospitals, the wider biomedical precinct, other institutions and um, research institutes welcome. And I welcome many people from the government sector with your welcome interest in disability from a policy perspective, and a particularly warm welcome to the seeing eye dog in front, who's just being so wonderful uh, under provocation, um, just so impressive. Uh, we don't often get to launch an academic project of national significance, and yet that's why we're here this afternoon. And we wouldn't be here but for Bruce Bonahady, who's been such a powerful force in bringing together the elements of the Melbourne Disability Institute. I do want to acknowledge that this institute builds on a long series of work here. The Hallmark Disability Institute that was led by Keith McFarley and Anne Einstein Keslake and was hugely important. It built on an ARC, on an NH and MRC Centre of Research Excellence led by Professor Anne Kavanagh, and we'll hear from Anne shortly. Um, 
the vision of bringing together law and architecture and economics and public policy and social sciences and public health is what will make this special. Uh, and it will be able to work closely uh, with, we hope, the NDIS, that's the plan, particularly around the new data that the National Disability Scheme will make possible. Because we keep hearing about big data changing our lives, but here is an incredibly practical way in which we will learn so much more about the lives and the aspirations and the outcomes experienced by people with disability as they work through the scheme. And that's the sort of data that can help us grow and improve outcomes for everybody. Um, it will guide policy, it'll guide new research, it'll allow us to be a world leader in thinking about disability and designing effective programs that make a difference in the lives of people who matter. Many of you in this room have been arguing and thinking and talking about this area all of your lives. It has been really close to your hearts and you're here because you care about it. And I could talk about almost anyone in the room in that circumstances, but I do want to in particular acknowledge Professor Brian Howe, who's been a close uh, advisor to Bruce Bonhady, who's been working and thinking about this issue through a lifetime of government, a lifetime of, of academic research, uh, whose determination to shape a better disability policy for Australia has been significant, sustained, and impactful. So thank you, Brian, for being here and for being, making this possible. It's hugely appreciated. And this institute is going to be a success because of Professor Anne Kavanagh. She's the academic director of the Melbourne Disability Institute. She's also been appointed to a new chair in disability and health which is made possible by funds generously donated to the university through the Leary Bequest. Anne is internationally celebrated for her research on disability. She's also a strong disability advocate who brings to the role her lived experiences. Thank you, Anne, for taking on this leadership. Hugely appreciate it. You are here because you share this vision, because you see why this matters, because you want a better deal for people. We share that aspiration with you. This is an opportunity for this university to show what engaged research looks like and how we can make a difference in policy outcomes as well as in the fundamental research we do. The creation of the National Disability Insurance Scheme and today the launching of the Melbourne Disability Institute are both responses to this challenge of making a difference in people's lives, giving them the lives they have reason to value and making those lives possible. I'm absolutely delighted that this university will be home to this new interdisciplinary research institute and it's an honour to now officially declare launched the Melbourne Disability Institute. Thank you. Vice-Chancellor, thank you. Well, we will now hear from the new director of the uh, Disability Institute, Bruce Bonnie-Heddy. Please welcome him. Distinguished guests, colleagues, friends and fellow disability reformers, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and to pay my respects to their elders past and present. I would also like to particularly acknowledge the Secretary of the Department of Empowerment of People with Disability in the Government of India, Secretary Gamelin, and the Chairman of the National Disability Insurance Agency, Dr Helen Nugent. I'm honoured and humbled to be standing here today as the Executive Chair and Director of the Melbourne Disability Institute. It's also very exciting, exciting to be able to build on my work as a disability reformer in a new interdisciplinary institute at one of the highest ranking universities in the world and to bring to this endeavour more than 30 years lived experience as the father of two young men with multiple disabilities and all I have learnt from them. Exciting to build on the work of the university's hallmark disability research initiative, which was led by Dr. Anna Arstein Kerslake and Professor Keith McVilly. Exciting to have the opportunity to work with Professor Anne Kavanagh, 
the academic director of the Melbourne Disability Institute, and the many other experts, scholars, and researchers across all the faculties and institutes of the university. Exciting to be able to build on existing university partnerships and to build new partnerships. Exciting to be building the evidence to transform the lives of people with disability, their families and carers. When I first approached the Vice-Chancellor, Professor Glyn Davis, in late 2016 with the observation that the NDIS is building the best disability database in the world, including measures of functional impairment, supports and outcomes, and that this could be a platform for world-leading research, he instantly welcomed the idea and invited me to meet with scholars and researchers across the university. I was fortunate, as Glyn has mentioned, that I already knew the Vice-Chancellor. For the past 15 years, I've been working alongside two extraordinarily dedicated and committed parents of children with disabilities to establish two perpetually endowed chairs in neurodevelopment and disability at the university based at the Royal Children's Hospital. As a result of our shared work, I was therefore known to the university. Tonight, I would therefore like to publicly honour and thank Katie O'Callaghan and Dr. Bob Dickens. Sadly, Katie is not well enough to be here, but Bob is here, as is Katie's son, Jonty, who is studying at Melbourne and recently represented Australia at the Winter Paralympics. I was also fortunate to know that the Vice-Chancellor had a deep personal interest in disability and to learn that under his leadership, the university has developed interdisciplinary research institutes which placed it ideally to embrace research centred on advancing the lives of people with disability, their families and carers, rather than centred on a single discipline or field of study. As a result, the Melbourne Disability Institute, or MDI, was approved by council late last year. MDI is also benefiting from a generous allocation of seed funding for the Institute, for my role as director, and for Professor Anne Kavanagh. The founding of MDI, therefore, not only demonstrates great vision and purpose, it demonstrates how the university is using its philanthropic funding to have strategic impact in an area of great community importance and need. I would therefore like to thank the Vice-Chancellor and his senior colleagues, Professor Jim McCluskey, Deputy Vice-Chancellor Research, and Professor Mark Hargraves, Pro-Vice-Chancellor Research, with whom I've had the great pleasure of working closely since my initial meeting with the Vice-Chancellor some 18 months ago. MDI is a platform, a platform for the transformations of people's lives, for innovation, for building evidence through research, for partnerships, for inclusion, and for interdisciplinary teaching and learning. At its core, the purpose of MDI is to improve the lives of people with disability, their families and carers through interdisciplinary research. And there could be no better time to be embarking on this challenge as a wave of change creates enormous opportunities for people with disabilities as well as risks that some of Australia's most vulnerable citizens will be left behind. The academic goals of publication and new competitive grants are also essential to us, but these must fall within the purpose of MDI. In our work, we are already engaging with all the faculties and other interdisciplinary institutes of the university. Our purpose is broad. It is for and with all people with disability, their families and carers. We will co-design and co-produce with the disability sector. Our capacity and resources will be aligned to advance the comprehensive goals of the National Disability Strategy, inclusive and accessible community, rights, protection and justice, economic security, personal and community support, learning and skills, and health and well-being. We're also aligning our research activities with Australia's commitments under the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability, or UNCPRD, and the National Disability Insurance Scheme Act of 2013. 
Together, the UNCPRD, NDIS and National Disability Strategy are creating the potential for a very different future for people with disability, their families and carers. The NDIS is the most significant social and economic policy reform since the introduction of the original Medicare scheme in the 1970s. In many ways, the biggest and most significant change from the NDIS is not the insurance framework or control and choice or building inclusion and capacity through local area coordination. The biggest change is that Australia is building the best whole of population and longitudinal disability database in the world with the potential to link this data set to other relevant data from education, employment, health and justice. Data provides the potential to compare forecasts with experience, to regularly monitor and check progress, to analyse, to learn, to correct policy settings and practices, to transform the lives of people with disability. We know from the recent Productivity Commission review of NDIS costs that the NDIS is delivering significant benefits and it is sustainable provided it is well managed. The significance of this review cannot be overstated, given we now have data from 140,000 participants, compared with about 3,000 when the first Productivity Commission review was undertaken in 2011. At the same time, we also know from the independent evaluation of the NDIS by the National Institute of Labor Studies that it is not working for everyone. Now, the key to the full success and continued sustainability of the NDIS lies in analysing data to find the optimal solutions. However, today, all the new NDIS data is still only available to the National Disability Insurance Agency, or NDIA. In its report last year, the Productivity Commission recommended that the NDIA should make its data available by the middle of this year utilising well-developed data sharing protocols to ensure that it is safely stored, managed and used for research. We've found in our meetings with a wide range of people across the disability sector that the lack of availability of data and hence the ability to contribute to the sustainable delivery of the NDIS is the biggest fact issue facing the sector. Therefore, one of our foundation objectives is to work with the disability sector and other research institutes to democratise disability data. At MDI, we're also committed to working collaboratively to address the major systemic and strategic challenges and opportunities facing people with disability. Equity and fairness, especially for Indigenous Australians, called groups and those with mental health issues low employment rates, an education system which too often fails students with disability, uneven medical services and healthcare, optimising early intervention, insufficient housing and increasing the use of universal design, a justice system which incarcerates far too many people with disability, disability rights, improving quality and safeguards, increasing inclusion and accessibility, building individual family and community capacity, sustaining and nurturing families and other informal supports, the sustainability of the NDIS and maximising the benefits from its long-term insurance structure, structuring and funding for information linkages and capacity building, harnessing markets to serve people with disability and managing risks of market failure, workforce training and development, and smart use of technology. We're also developing strategies so that NDI, MDI becomes a catalyst for new partnerships which foster the exchange and enrichment of ideas, practices, and policies, nationally and internationally. It's therefore particularly pleasing to have Secretary Gamlin and her colleague, Dr. Seth, here today and so they can meet with key disability experts from the University of Melbourne. In Australia, we're deeply interested in partnering with organisations and startups who want to build the evidence for their new service models. 
were also attracted to the work of Elise Roy and the operating model of MIT labs, where conventional thinking is reversed and everything is designed with people with disability at the center. This is very powerful because it leads to true universal design. There's therefore much for MDI to do in the years ahead to ensure that the vision built into the National Disability Strategy, UNCPRD, and NDIS is delivered. Exactly five years ago, on the 28th of May 2013, the National Disability Insurance Scheme Act received royal assent. On that day, Australians with disability, their families, families and carers celebrated. It was a landmark moment which was only possible because of unity within the disability sector. 50 years ago today, the student riots of 1968 in Paris were reaching their zenith. Within a few days, the President of France, General de Gaulle, resigned. The students celebrated what they thought was a great victory. But then, immediately, the students went home and in the ensuing election, the Gaullists won a landmark majority. And in effect, Gaullism continued without de Gaulle. We need to learn from their experience. We need to recapture the unity of five years ago and build the evidence and the solutions to shape future policy directions and implementation. At the Melbourne Disability Institute, we're committed to working together and to building the evidence for that transformation. Thank you very much. Carney is an NDIS ambassador and advocates on behalf of many other national issues of importance. Carney. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for having me along here this afternoon. I feel very privileged and honoured to be here, especially um, hearing Bruce Bonahady speak again about, and it reminded me that five years ago, I was actually at that launch of the NDIA, and I do agree with Bruce that we do have to come together again. And the reason I'm so excited to be here to launch the Melbourne Disability Institute is because it shows once again that we do matter and that we, we want to count people with disabilities in all data and all things moving forward. And as a person with a disability, I'm often described, as I just was then, um, and introduced wherever I go as a Paralympian, a world record holder, a social worker, a commentator, and now a mother. And I guess because I was born with my disability and I have a muscle wasting disease, I'm also often described, because I've done all those things in spite of my disability, as being extraordinary. And I'm often described as being inspirational and amazing, in fact, I don't think I've ever been to a pub or to a department store or a mall where I haven't been high-fived or congratulated on just being there, on buying my Vegemite at Coles or buying my jeans or going to work or buying my coffee in the morning. I definitely have not been to a pub and ordered a red wine without being high-fived for ordering that red wine. Now, I want to ask this quickly, how many people in the room have been high-fived for ordering a red wine? <laughs> Apart from George. How many people have been uh, high-fived, congratulated for living independently away from their parents at 39 years of age? <laughs> how many people have been high-fived and congratulated about working, having a job, and now I'm discovering I'm being high-fived and paddle on the head um, because a person with a muscle disease, just so you know, really finds it very hard to high-five. We're very good at a low-five, <laughs> not so good at the high-five. <laughs> I'm often paddle on the head or low-fived now because I'm a mother. Good on you for being brave enough. Anyone here a mother? Anyone here been high-fived and congratulated for being brave enough? Good on you. I do want to say to you, though, good on you. 
<laughs> Good on you. Now, I was born with my muscle wasting disease and like most people with a disability, when you are diagnosed with a disability at birth, like I was, obviously for those nine months leading up to that diagnosis, my mother was like every other mother, just like I was when I was pregnant with my beautiful darling boy, Kai. Uh, Mum was asked the very typical question when you're pregnant, what do you want to have, a boy or a girl? And of course my mother answered that question with that universally accepted response, I don't care as long as my baby is healthy. And some of us mothers even go into that even further. I know that I was around a lot of my friends when they were pregnant and they'd really go into that. They'd really say, oh, it'd really be really bad if I had X, Y, Z disability. And that was quite typical, accepted and normal for people who are pregnant and mothers and fathers in that nine months to say that. So it's very typical and normal for people with disabilities before we even arrive into the world to be labelled as being not wanted. That's the only way you can look at it because, oh, oh it wouldn't be bad if we had an unhealthy baby. What would happen? I couldn't cope. What would I do? And us people with disabilities are very aware of that because often people tell us that all the time. They couldn't handle it. It'd be really hard, it'd be really difficult. Good on you. It's amazing that you're so positive, even though you've got a disability. <laughs> so constantly we're told that we are difficult and it's hard and it's less than, you, you are less than. So before we even arrive, we're told that. And luckily for me, I was born into a family that celebrated me. So I didn't feel uncelebrated when I arrived into that world. But before we even arrive, that's what happens. And then we really just place labels on people with disabilities before they even start their life. And then those labels, they get stickier and there's more and more of them that get piled onto us everywhere we go. And we're often told in this Instagram obsessed society by bloggers and people that are supposedly very well experienced and knowledgeable in this area that we really should be thinking positively and we should be putting out all this positive stuff into the world and we should be careful of what we say to each other, be kind to each other. If you put it out, it'll come true. But it seems that only exists to 80% of the population because the 20% of us with a disability, we're constantly told by actions and by words that we aren't important, that we are less than. And that happens a lot with data and research. If we're not counted, and now I, I sit in policy and government, I know that if you don't have that data, you actually can't change the policy that then affects the unhealthy babies amongst us. If we're not counted, right from the start, we're showing that we're not important enough, the 20% of us that make up a multi-billion dollar industry. The disability sector is actually an industry. And it became an industry because obviously we need the supports and services to get out the front door of our apartments and houses and hopefully live a great, normal, good life. So we've got this industry, but we're not counted. And being the unhealthy baby, my parents were told their firstborn child had a neuromuscular wasting disease, wouldn't walk, wouldn't crawl, and would not live past her teenage Years And my parents were told, like most parents of children with disabilities, to make me as comfortable as possible, put me into an institution, and whatever you do, don't do any exercise or rehabilitation with her. Because the worst thing you could possibly do is to do exercise or rehabilitation. Now, I'm very fortunate. I believe the only reason I'm up here today, I'm healthy. I drink lots of green juice. I'm one of those annoying, organic, gluten-free people. One of the reasons I believe I'm healthy, I'm still walking, I only use this $20,000 beautiful BMW type contraption <coughs> for longer distances, so I, I can still walk shorter distances, so I only use this wheelchair really for parking. And, <laughs> and I believe the reason why I'm also just out of my teenage years 
is because my parents actually decided, like most parents in the room, to not listen to those experts with all those degrees, even though my parents didn't have a degree. And they started me what I lovingly call a crazy rehab program, which started with this standing frame. If you're wondering why that photo is up there, it's because they started their rehab program with this. This is a standing frame which was very heavily used in the 80s. The reason I show you this is because if you're a mother or a father, you'd understand that trying to strap a two-year-old into anything <laughs> is practically impossible. Now that I'm a social worker, I also know it's kind of illegal. <laughs> I may need one for my 17-month-old son, though. He's very difficult to keep up with. But Mum and Dad tried to strap me into this because but until this moment in time, I didn't do anything. I didn't roll over, I didn't walk, I didn't crawl, I didn't sit up, I didn't reach for a rattle. So I didn't reach any of those milestones that obviously parents are so obsessed with. I'm one of those parents now. I understand why you want to be able to reach those milestones because you don't want your kid to have any of those labels. You don't want your kid to hear, oh, she can't crawl yet. Oh, all the things that we hear as adults. Oh, we parents want to try and really protect those children with disabilities from those types of labels and statements and words. So they started the rehab program with this. It was very difficult. My father disappeared in the backyard shed for, I don't know, six, seven, eight days. We had no idea what he was doing in the backyard shed. He's a man from Rockhampton. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, when you feel sorry for me because one of the cards in my hand of cards was the fact that I have a muscle wasting disease, feel way more sorry for me that I'm from the beef capital of Australia. <laughs> Who's from here? He's from Rockhampton. There's always one. So in other words, <laughs> there's 10 people in the room from Rockhampton. Because when I leave here, at least another nine people will come up to me and say, I'm also from Rockhampton, but I was, too, <laughs> I was too embarrassed to put up my hand. I'm from the beef capital of Australia, and my dad went into the backyard shed, didn't know what to do with this standing frame. But, like most men, he tinkered with it, he played with it, and he solved it by putting wheels on it. <laughs> now, as you can see, I'm looking very, very happy. On this torturous type contraption, my mother actually pushed me around the neighbourhood for up to six hours a day, every single day. Because don't forget, back then there was no specialist in muscle wasting diseases, especially in Rockhampton. And we are very limited in our research about disability in general, so you can only imagine what it was like in 1979. So my parents had to follow their instinct. So once they put me onto this contraption and my mother was strapped me into it for six hours a day. I very luckily, I walked at the age of three and a half and this to my parents was their greatest day. My parents would never bore you with stories about my Paralympic achievements, but they will bore you with stories about this day, the day that I took my first step. Because very simply, they figured out that exercise, well, it must work. She's now walking after six hours of exercise every day. But more essentially, they just became typical. They became like every other parent. All of a sudden, their child was reaching a milestone. And they could go along to the playground and their child was doing what everyone else's child was doing. And from here, when mum and dad figured out the exercise actually works, I literally became the fittest three-year-old in Rockhampton. <laughs> they tried everything from swimming, horse riding, here I am on horseback at Rockhampton, horse riding for the disabled. That is my father in those hot 80s white rugby league <laughs> pants. <laughs> but as you can see, I'm ticking off milestones, I'm sitting up, I'm walking. The next natural step in the 80s is to go along to school. And Bruce touched on education with students with disabilities, but in the 80s, we really weren't welcome in mainstream schools. We still have a long way to go with inclusion and integration. I say those words very carefully. But in the 80s, people like me did not easily go along to mainstream schools, especially in the beef capital of Australia. So my mother, who's a very persistent woman, <laughs> that's a really nice word for it, fought for me to go along to a mainstream school. She won 
And of course, I went along to a Catholic primary school in Rockhampton, and like most children, I just tried to keep up. Every day in the playground, at sporting carnivals, I just tried to keep up. When I do walk, I walk with a really obvious limp. The medical community call it a gait. I call it a swagger. <laughs> it gets better with a couple of those red wines that you guys high five me for. But you can't drink red wine in grade one, so I had to use other things to try and keep up in the playground. But when I did try and keep up with this obvious limp, especially at those sporting carnivals, that I was always the first kid to put up my hand to play everything, even though I was the only kid with a disability at the school. I came home with lots... Oh, that's my baby. I didn't come home with any of them. I came home with lots and lots of these. Good try, ribbons. Nobody wakes up the morning of the sporting carnival and says, you know what I want to win today? I really hope I win the good try, ribbon. That's what I've been training for. And of course, even though I had a disability, I certainly wasn't aware of it and I did not want to win the good try ribbon. So luckily for me, my mother very miraculously, and I hate that word miracle, but in the 80s without Google and without these two words going together, disabled sport, it was kind of like a miracle for my mother to find a disabled sporting competition in Brisbane when I was eight years of age. She entered me into the 25 metres free so we flew down on the big plane for the, to the big city for my big first real race, the 25 metres freestyle. Now, when you're eight, you guys are probably all understand this, you're either parents or you're around children. If you tell an eight-year-old kid they can do anything, they believe you. So if you tell an eight-year-old kid they can climb Mount Everest, they believe you. If you tell an eight-year-old kid they can swim the 25 metres freestyle, they believe you. So when my mother entered me in the 25 metres freestyle and I was all decked out in my togs and my cap and my goggles, I believed that I could make 25 metres freestyle. I just thought my mum was being really supportive and cool by wearing her togs. <laughs> in the grandstand. The reason she was wearing her togs is she arrived at the big plane, big city, and realised that the shortest event in the program is the 25 metres freestyle, and there's no way that I could make 25 metres freestyle. I could make maybe 10 metres. I couldn't lift my arms above my head. I still can't. So she entered me in the 25 metres freestyle. She crossed her fingers. She crossed her leg, she hoped the lifeguard would jump in if anything should go wrong, but just in case she was ready. <laughs> so I made the very, very long 25 metres freestyle in four minutes and 56 seconds <laughs> and came out with one of these, the magical blue ribbon. Sat my parents down in a very official type meeting back in Rockhampton after I won the magical blue ribbon, and said to my parents, Mum and Dad, it's obvious, I'm good. <laughs> I've swum 25 metres freestyle in four minutes and 56 seconds. I figured it out. I figured out what I'm going to do with my life. I'm going to be a swimmer. I'm going to be an Olympian. Now, when I told my parents this crazy, ridiculous dream about doing the most physical thing you can ever do in your life, which is out now actually very much celebrated and a great idea for people with disabilities to, be, to do this, because now we have the Paralympics and they're very much funded and integrated and included and paid. But back in the 80s, when I told my parents that I wanted to be an Olympian, that's because I'd never heard about the Paralympic Games. None of us had. So when I told my parents this crazy, ridiculous dream that I wanted to be a swimmer, even though I can't lift my arms above my head, they agreed with me. They just nodded their heads. And my mum drove me to the pool whenever I wanted to go. She cried for a long time, like most mothers of children with disabilities cry about their children's crazy, ridiculous, wild dreams that often don't match up with their circumstances or their bodies or their minds, or the cards that were dealt. 
My mum cried for a very long time thinking, how is she ever going to tell her child that she cannot be an Olympian and she definitely can't be a swimmer. But what happened on that day is my parents nodded their heads. It was a very simple act. And what happens is when you decide that you want to do something, so you grab the strongest card I believe in anyone's deck, this card of choice, and then you find a head nodder. I was pretty lucky. I didn't have to even leave my lounge room to find mine. Most people with disabilities aren't as lucky as me. They don't find their head nodders in their lounge rooms. When you find them and they match up, then you're off. And I was lucky enough to grab myself my own label at the age of eight. And I just attached it to myself and it became my shield. And even as a 39-year-old has-been mother that can no longer keep up with any of these new Paralympians, I, was, I am still introduced to you today as a Paralympian, as a swimmer, because I chose that label for myself. And I went to many Paralympic Games, as you heard, and as I was retiring from sport, I was thinking about this just recently, as I was retiring from sport, which seems like a decade or a lifetime ago, and when I was retiring from sport, I was very fortunate to understand what I had to do with the rest of my life as I closed that chapter on swimming, because I was asked to speak at a medical convention as I was retiring from sport. At the age of 25, as most of us are when we retire, I was asked to speak in front of 5,000 medical practitioners, <laughs> doctors, physios, nurses, speeches, OTs, and leading up to this conference, my mother really annoyingly asked me to go along to this particular speech. I had no idea why she wanted to come so desperately, but you don't say no to anybody from Rockhampton. <laughs> You certainly don't say no to Terry Liddell from Rockhampton. So I said, of course you can come along, Mum, to this particular conference. I don't want to see you, though. When I'm up on stage, I don't want to see you in the auditorium. So she came along to my speech, and then 5,000 people, I didn't see her. She was up at the back of the auditorium with my father, and as I was looking around the room like I am today, at everyone in the room, I locked eyes on a doctor. The reason I knew he was a doctor is when I saw him, I realised and recognised that he was a doctor that had diagnosed me when I was three years old. And he was the doctor that told my parents to put me into Montrose home and he told my parents to go along to Montrose home when I was about three or four and we think the reason why he told my parents to go along to Montrose home is because my mother so annoyingly rang him every single Tuesday. It was in her diary. She would call and she asked him questions about my disease, future, rehab, school, sport. So we think he thought the best thing to do to stop Terry Liddell from calling would be to show her what this disease looks like and then she'd stop calling with these silly questions. So mum and dad went along to this place and they saw children with muscle wasting diseases, I guess. They look a bit like me now. They saw children and teenagers and adults that were in electric wheelchairs. Some of them were ventilated. Some of them were unable to roll over in bed anymore by themselves. They were in electric beds. And that's what my parents saw when I was three and a half years of age because of this man that was sitting in my crowd. And once I saw him, I knew exactly why my mother was at this particular speech. <laughs> Not a great place to realise it when you're in front of 5,000 people. But at the end of my speech, after staring at this man for the entire 20 minutes, <coughs> I finished my speech and I thought, I want to talk to this man a little bit more. We haven't had enough time together. 20 minutes is not enough time. So I thought I'm going to have to chase this guy down because I really want to have a chat to him about helping me understand that the greatest pleasure in life for me has been achieving things that people say can't be done. And I don't want that to be the case for people with disabilities moving forward. 
That's not what I want us to be driven by anymore. But I thought I'm gonna chase this man down. So I put my wheelchair on level two. I was ready. And as I was ready to chase him down, he was actually coming over to me. He was sweating, pale. He just had the worst 20 minutes of his life. He was coming this way, and you can only imagine he was coming this way. <laughs> so as I was about to deliver the best speech of my life to this doctor, he just threw a folder at me. Didn't say a word. And on this folder, a manila folder. So of course, anybody that's ever been through the medical world understands what a manila folder is. It had my name on it. I knew it was my medical folder. And it was, of course, very thick, as all their medical folders are. And as I opened up what I thought was my medical folder, I became speechless for the first time in my life because hundreds and hundreds of press clippings of my life, my Paralympic achievements fell onto the floor. And as all of these press clippings fell onto the floor, all I could muster up to say to him was, why on heaven's earth do you have all these press clippings of me? <laughs> and he said to me that day, your mother has been sending me bloody <laughs> press clippings. <laughs> for the past 15 years. <laughs> now on this day, he said to Terry Liddell, not to me, now Terry, whenever I diagnose a child that looks a bit like Carney, I now say these three words. Exercise may help. Not will, because it doesn't always work for children with muscle wasting diseases. I know that I'm lucky. Just like chemo doesn't work for every cancer patient. I know that I'm lucky. He doesn't say will, he says may. And those three words are more powerful and more important to me than all those medals that I won throughout my career. But the most important thing about that day is what I took into my next career, which is now. And I learned that from my mother. I learned that because my mother sat in her lounge room with no Instagram, no audience, no idea what was going to happen with those press clippings. She didn't even tell my father what she was doing. She sat there with scissors, pen, envelope and a stamp. She cut those press clippings out and she put them in those envelopes and she sent them along to that man, to that doctor. And she taught me that the smallest of acts can create the largest of impacts. She changed how we diagnose muscle wasting diseases in this country. She's talked about in medical journals and research papers, my mother, Terry Liddell, from Rockhampton with no university degree. The smallest of acts can create the largest of impacts. And that's the reason I'm here today. This is not a small act. This is not a small act. But this will help people like Terry Liddell's of the world, like the Carney Liddell's of the world, to not have to fight for everything that we do. I'm tired of the fight. Five years ago, when I launched the NDIA in Geelong, I was fatigued and I, breathed, I, I had a breath of relief. For the first time, I had that knot in my stomach released. We don't just fight for funding for supports and services, we fight to catch cabs, we fight to catch planes. We fight to get diagnosed, we fight for medical. We, we fight, we fight, we fight. Parents fight and we are sick of the fight. We need an army of hope givers and head nodders. And I truly believe finally that the Melbourne Dis Disability Institute will let us all breathe out a sigh of relief so we can go on and just lead great, amazing lives. The 20% of us Australians with our tribe, I truly believe that when you finally count us and finally see us, you will start to see us in every part of Australia. You will start to see us behind desks working. You will start to see us in labs, you will start to see us everywhere leading our best lives.
but the Carney Liddells and the Terry Liddells of the world are very tired. And I thank you, Bruce Bonahady, and everyone else involved in this institute, because I am ready for the next phase of our lives to not have to fight so hard anymore. Thank you. Carney, I think um, um, that ovation tells you there's going to be a lot of people high-fiving you um, for drinks, which will be very, very soon, or the low five. I mean, I'm keen to see the low five, I have to say. And look, I was just thinking that the next time we have a lot of uh, honorary fellows here at the university, the next time we're going to appoint one, I don't know if we, it's a toss-up between you or your mother. <laughs> well, we'll work on that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Well, we, we move now to... Um, someone who's got a very important job um, to help the Carnies of this world um, move on from the fight. And of course, it's Professor Anne Kavanagh. Anne is widely known for her research on disability. She leads a research team at the Melbourne School of Population and Global Health, and as we've heard, is the inaugural chair of disability and health, as well as the academic director of the MDI. Please welcome Anne Kavanagh. Um, so we're starting with the Vox Pops or finishing with the Vox Pops? I'll, I'll, I'll talk. Okay. Thank you. That's really hard to uh, follow because I don't have any jokes. <laughs> That's my one and only joke. So just get your laughing out of you now, okay? So um, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I've had a great time in my career, which I'm truly grateful for, but it took me until I was 55 years old, which is only two days ago, by the way, to get the job that I really wanted. And so here I am with a new chair in disability and health, generously funded through the Leary bequest and academic director of the Melbourne Disability Institute, working with Bruce as director. And here I am in a position to use my skills to help the situation for my people, people with disabilities, their families and carers. I'm a medical practitioner and an epidemiologist, and I've devoted a large part of my research career to understanding the social, economic and political drivers of health and wellbeing to trying to create evidence that might make our world just a bit fairer. More importantly though, I'm the mother of two beautiful sons, Alastair and Declan, and a partner to Evelyn. In 2002, my life was transformed by the birth of our much anticipated first child, Declan. Dream child, we had a great time. A few things like speech delay worried us a little, but as time went on, it was obvious that things weren't quite going the way the book said they should. Declan was diagnosed with autism, an intellectual disability and severe anxiety, which means that the world is a tough place for him to navigate. And then began our journey into a boggling, opaque disability service system, a resistant education system, and at many times an unfriendly, unwelcoming, judgmental community. We got to know very quickly who our allies were. I was struck by how defeated and exhausted we were battling a complex system and wondered just how much harder it might be for those with less power and agency than we had. And then in 2011, I experienced extreme fatigue, vertigo, leg weakness, and a range of other worrying symptoms and was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. 
Again, I had agency. I understood the health system, although I was terrified by the diagnosis. What I had learnt at medical school suggested I was headed for a rapid progression to increasing disability and early death. Six years later, that hasn't been the way, but I continue to experience intermittent symptoms, uh, particularly fatigue. And those symptoms combined with my pretty much lifelong experiences of anxiety and depression mean that like Declan, the world is sometimes a tricky place for me. But from challenge and lived experience comes opportunity. My lived experience of disability met my professional expertise. My experiences with the disability sector showed just how disadvantaged people with disabilities are. And so my own research now concentrates on finding out how we can turn around that disadvantage that people with disabilities and their families encounter and promote their health and wellbeing. Our team's research shows how employment, quality work, affordable and accessible housing, social support, access to transport, education and freedom from discrimination promote health for people with disability. But there remains a fundamental problem which hampers our research. Our methods are cutting edge, but the data is not up to scratch. Measuring disability is difficult and contested. And as Bruce has described, we don't have good longitudinal data yet that can help, help us evaluate the impacts of policies and programs and make evidence-based policy decisions for the future. We are likely to be able to get linked up census, administrative data on health, social services, education and employment in the near future, and hopefully sometime soon NDIS data will form part of a very rich database that we can interrogate to answer real world, wicked problems that face the sector today. So data about us gives us power. But having data to count is only part of the picture. What data is collected and counted, who counts it and how it is counted is also critical. Data is not neutral. Putting this talk together reminded me of a chapter I wrote some years ago, Epidemiology and Technologies of Quantification, where I reflected on my own power as an epidemiologist as someone who counts and manipulates data. How I choose to do that is deeply political. We all know that politicians tell stories with data that serves their political ends. And we can do that too. We do that too. I believe that as academics, we have a responsibility to seek the perspectives of multiple disciplines, sectors and actors, most importantly, people with disabilities, about the data we count and how we count it. That is why we must and will reach out to those from whom the data is collected. And as actors independent of government, we are in a unique position to do this. Sticking to the data theme, at the Institute, we also recognise that what counts as data cannot always be counted. I'll say that again. What counts as data cannot always be counted. To base evidence only on countable data misses a lot. Qualitative data collected from all actors in the sector, particularly people with disabilities, and their families is critical. Policy analysis is central. Engineering, smart technologies can unleash new possibilities. Legal research that enables people with disabilities to realise their rights are just some examples of the way in which many different types of data can be deployed. And that's where the beauty of an interdisciplinary institute comes to life, at the intersections of disciplines and perspectives that enable new ways of knowing. 
Before I finish, which is pretty soon, um, there are a few people behind the scenes uh, that I'd like to thank who have made this event possible. First, Melissa Kavanagh, and she's no relation to me. She keeps telling everyone, but she's behind here. <laughs> Tessa DeVeris over there, and Jenny Crosby, who have put a lot of work into putting this event together. So thank you for that. And thanks to you all for being with us in starting this journey. Keep travelling with us. We want to work with you to bring about transformation. I just want to also, we've got a few Vox Pops. As you go out, you might want to just reflect on these. These are, again, from some of our, um, our stakeholders and partners um, talking about what the Disability Institute means for them. Thank you. Thank you.